The views and opinions of this program are those of the host guests and callers. There is substantial risk of loss in trading futures and options, which you should carefully consider prior to trading. For over 95 years, we've set the bar. Power, we restored it. Protection, we reinvented it. Record yields, we redefined it. If there's one thing we know at FS, it's that just because something hasn't been done, doesn't mean it can't be done. We're never satisfied unless we take your farming operation to the next level. Run your equipment at peak efficiency and bust the bins this season. Visit fssystem.com. When it was all said and done on Wednesday, this grain market across the board found a little bit of positivity, some double-digit gains in wheat, soybeans, and corn throughout the session, a little more mixed activity in livestock. Outside markets were relatively quiet, but we'll consider it a win midweek. We're going to talk about things. Joining us here today with his analysis, Mike Zuzalo from Global Commodity Analytics is our guest on the show today. Mike, good to catch up with you, my friend. And I know uh, both of us doing our best to stay cool underneath this giant heat dome that centered itself across the uh, midsection of the country this week. Yeah, not succeeding too well either, I might add, Jesse. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we try as best as we can. I, I don't know how well I'm succeeding either, but I, I'm trying. And, you know, I, that's something that uh, our corded soybean crops are trying to hang on here as well with this heat dome over the center of the country this week. And that's one thing to talk about. And it's going to help frame up our broader uh, discussion to start today, talking about just El Nino in general and not only the U.S. impacts, but the global impacts here in this market trade, Mike. Yeah, I, I think the thing that is key about Wednesday's trade to me was, and I sent this out to clients and subscribers on Tuesday night, I, I said, I think we're close to some type of low in the wheat because it seems like we were getting some negative news out there, whether it was a crop tour news, whether it was uh, Jordan canceling a, bar, a barley tender, or whether it was Sovicon raising the wheat crop in Russia. Um, I, I think the market saw the funds not press the downside in the wheat. And in fact, by Tuesday's close, some of the sentiment and momentum indicators, and there are true sentiment and momentum indicators that you can put onto key charts. And I do that and follow that, Jesse. They were starting to go from, for instance, a negative 150 in terms of momentum and sentiment back to close to zero within just five or six trading days. That can be indicative of the fund saying, you know what, we've pressed this thing as hard as we can. There's no more buyers out there to suck in on rallies. Let's cover some shorts here. And I think that was part of Wednesday's trade. But I'm also curious to know whether this has a little bit more life to it because of what's going on in the world, in the world of uh, agriculture, and especially <laughs> in Europe, where Europe has been the epicenter of depressed prices, whether it's Ukraine, Russia or or the EU. I mean, just today, um, one of the Ukrainian updates that I get said that off the port uh, in Danube, after another big drone strike and another loss of capacity uh, at a major port in, in near the Danube River in Ukraine, um, that, that there's as many as 70 ships that are backed up. And does that make a difference today versus the other day uh, or, or three to weeks ago? You know, it hasn't so far. And so that's kind of what I'm watching. I think I saw a stat too, 15% uh, capacity now, roughly around there is where Ukraine is at after more drone strikes. So, I mean, thinking about that in the long-term picture, and uh, we'll tie this in here a little bit as well with the, some of the EU weather models you sent me, but that that's a big picture thing to think about here longer term as well as 15% capacity. That's not good, Mike. No, and that's just one port. And, and the thing that caught my attention as well, kind of dovetailing with what you just said, was there was a Newswire story on Reuters late in the day, and the head of Turkey, Mr. Erdogan, had shut down the Bosphorus Strait um, that links up the Black Sea and the rest of uh, the Mediterranean and, and North Africa because he had to let helicopters and planes take water in for fighting fires off of their coast. And we've got Greece on fire, Turkey on fire. And you just got to wonder, well, what's that doing mm -hmm. to the grain situation? And what's that doing to the crops right now? And the, is the trade even looking at that at this point? 
Well, let's talk a little bit more. Uh, you shared a couple maps with me that I thought were quite interesting as we focus over on Europe. You know, we're talking a lot this week about the hot, dry weather in the U.S., but what about what's going on overseas? What's going on in Europe right now, Mike? Yeah, so, you know, with your show coming up and us being able to utilize the video so well and the graphics so well and, and you being so generous about letting me use those in our talking uh, in, in our conversation, I, I went ahead after seeing that story on Turkey and just looked at some of the major things going on. This is actually, and I tried to do some crop masking, Jesse, where it actually looks at agriculture instead of just broad brushing what's happening in those countries with weather. And this is a maize or a corn situation, relative soil moisture. This comes from Europe's uh, Joint Research Center, They're the big daddy, kind of the NOAA of Europe. And this is showing us compared to 1991 to now, it being the average period, where are we in terms of relative soil moisture? And red is a, at least a negative 30% compared to that period. Orange is negative 20 to negative 30%. So if you the darker orange, if you just look at those two colors, it is absolutely amazing that we have six, seven countries, uh, major grain producing countries, I would add, that are dealing with a significant, if not historic drought right now. And it really matches up with that Newswire story. Well, a second map as well that you shared. Uh, this is just more of that kind of crop masking that you, you mentioned and looking at the stress and, and more. And it is quite fascinating when you tie this in with the El Nino that we have upon us here and just some of the global weather concerns that continue to be out there, Mike. Yeah, one of the things that this map shows the prior one didn't is what's going on in Russia. And I found this to be very valuable because I am skeptical, once again, that Russia's crop is really 92 million tons. That's 7 million tons more than what USDA just put out a week or so ago. I still think that Russia is probably taking uh, grain with a, with a made-in-Ukraine tag on it at this point out of some key Crimean areas. And if that's the case, then we really don't have that kind of production number for the world to be able to be supplied upon. This map, which includes Russia and is overall cropland at a very low altitude, and that's the green is the crop areas. And then that's overlaid with an evaporative stress index. And it really shows up that some of these major crop growing areas um, including Russia and, and above Ukraine is Belarus and, and their major crop growing areas. Um, but some of the key growing areas of Russia, especially in the east, as you get closer to Georgia and Turkey, they have had problems and they are almost historic problems at this point. And so I continue to think to myself, how is Europe going to handle feeding Africa, let alone, you know, how are they going to handle feeding themselves, let alone ha handling feeding Africa and Southeast Asia, especially when you factor in what's happening with China and India and their weather concerns. And so I think this global El Nino story has legs to it. I'm not sure it will be right here right now, but what I wrote clients and, the, and subscribers last night was between the crop tour and between this analysis um, I still believe that there's a good likelihood that a major low could be in the offing pre-harvest. And I would say maybe even before the grain stocks report at the end of September. And I'm going to start adjusting my analysis that way. Another little facet I'll just throw at you as well. You mentioned India and China, some of the problems there. And we think about just the global grain flows. India's, you know, rice export ban, or possible talk. They could be bringing wheat in to help offset food inflation. And, you know, if you start to see some things like that happen, I feel like that could also be supportive to the wheat market overall, Mike. I agree. And I think that that takes us directly into our own crop tour that, you know, everyone has had their focus on this week. And I, I really don't look too much at the physical numbers of what the crop tour shows us because it is a snapshot in time. What I do look at is the maturity. And I had a client um, that was in York, uh, near York, Nebraska, near that York County, Gage County area, um, and, and areas like that, that uh, the crop tour went through. 
and I think they did a decent job of picking up on how bad the dryland corn was, but I'm not sure they really took in the complete measure of how tough the irrigated corn could still get hit at this stage. And he actually sent me some analysis from his major seed agronomist, major seed company agronomist this afternoon. And that agronomist told him that if you're at a quarter milk line, you could still lose 15 to 20% of your corn yield. Um, even at a half inch milk line, um, you could lose five to 10% of your yield. And so Jesse, I'm in a situation where I'm still in the mindset after seeing what I've seen in the crop tour that we've got enough immature corn out there. We can take the yields down if this heat wave returns, especially if we don't get any rains in between it. And I looked at the models just before you and I went on the air, the air and it looks like Des Moines is going to be back up close to, if not 95 degrees by next Wednesday, Thursday. So Last year, USDA went from 175.4 in July down to 171.9 in October. I think a similar type pattern could occur again this coming uh, three to four months. We're having a conversation today with Mike Zuzalo from Global Commodity Analytics. And Mike, talking about the heat and dryness as well, and I've heard some of those same concerns. I I've seen some chatter on social media, some folks saying this crop is going backwards quickly with this heat and dryness uh, around the country. Um, I think when we think about that and we think about, especially in the case of soybeans and a tighter balance sheet there, uh, I think this is a very, very curious thing to watch. And, you know, just looking at the soybean market in general, Mike, I'll pull up the next chart that you sent me. I think that's a good segue in here. Um, bean market, looking at the uh, historical charts for no beans, you know, 1360 and a half at the close on Wednesday. I feel like we could stay pretty elevated in this range here, if not go a little bit higher potentially, but I'd love to hear what you think right now. Well, this is a great time to be watching the soybeans because what this chart shows us in the midst of the crop tour and the midst of this heat wave here in the United States is that the 2023 soybeans, in, which is the purple li uh, purple lines, um, is going to decide, I think, right here, right now, whether it wants to track with 2013 and stay relatively strong, if not make new multi-month highs later this month and early next month before the next WASDE report, or whether it wants to nosedive like the corn did in like a 2008 type manner and, and literally gap lower, you know, in a, in a type of mindset that it is over and done with. And this really resonates with me also, Jesse, because what we saw today was September beans close at 1360 and a half, November close at 1361 and a quarter. That means like the wheat and the corn, soybeans is now back to a carrying charge market. And that is typically huge for the funds, because if you start to take the premium out of the back end, uh, front end and put it in the back end, that means you've done your job of rationing demand and the funds tend to go into a different type of mode of buying and selling. And instead of buying dips, they typically will sell rallies. And so that return to a, what we call a carrying charge in the old time business before the funds, the funds call contango, but we've not seen that relationship in lead month beans versus contract number two since December 30th of 2022. And so this is a critical time. If there was ever a time that the September would want to hold its premium as it gets ready for delivery, you would think it'd be right here right now as we lose a lot of yield. But China's buyers that were at a big soybean convention in New York on Tuesday said that they're going to maximize their imports at about 100 million metric tons. I buy into that because of China's economy and what's happening there. Um, and, but it was a wake up call, I think, to the demand bulls who thought mm -hmm. we needed to keep rationing. But this week's a critical week to whether I jump into puts. I'm not selling any cash beans at this stage. I want to be clear. But doing puts like I did in corn with clients, I think, is a really smart idea uh, in this stage of the market if we can't hold that and, and get back that inversion in the in the old crop. And great thoughts there. And we'll look at the world soybean prices as well. And I know this all factors in, obviously, a lot of cheap beans in South America for folks to gobble up, uh, like China, as you mentioned. But uh, to that point as well, uh, it's something to keep our eyes on. But still, China's been stepping in to buy some beans. But 
to your point about that Soy Connects conference in New York, uh, I was curious to hear what some of that chatter might be from that conference, Mike. Yeah, and, and, and you know, we talked about a lot of the uh, upcoming genetics that were coming to help improve yeah. the soybeans. It was a lot of what we typically hear at some of these conferences, a lot of future talk about how big the supplies can be and how innovative and technologically driven we still can be in agriculture. But I think this chart is, I put this up because the first thing you would think as a producer is, I'm not going to buy puts given the heat that we're dealing with and what kind of losses I could be looking at. We are still 50, and, and this is key, we are now $50 and still $50 a ton more expensive than Brazil. And look at how Brazil fell out of bed from mid-July, $570 a ton to now $90 lower within one month. And that speaks volumes to the decreased demand base and the ex extra supply that we have. And we got to remember, beans have held a premium against corn and wheat for many, many, many months. And at some point, I think that's got to be unwound. Mike, let's go over and talk livestock here today. I'll pull up uh, the live cattle continuation chart on the video feed for December. Talk to us about this a little bit, and I'll just throw out to you, I have to think that the hot weather this week is having an impact here in both cattle and in the hog market. It is. I was at a K-State extension meeting uh, on Tuesday, and uh, the talk in the, in the group of 30, 35 farmers that I spoke with and I was on behalf of K-State as I'm on the Atchison County Board. Um, but the, the, the talk was this, this a greenhouse effect of heavy dew and fog like we haven't seen before in this part of the country in the mornings has just allowed the corn to continue to grow and not lose too much yield. That's now changed with the humidity dropping. But they also were talking about cattle and the suffering the cattle were going through. And later in the day, I found out that there was a small feedlot in the county that had a pretty enormous percentage of death loss this week. And I'm looking for more of that to continue if this heat returns. And it looks like it's going to. It looks like Wichita, Hutchinson, uh, even up here in northeast Kansas near St. Joe, where I'm at in Atchison, we're going to be back in the heat index of 105, 106 next week by the models. And so this chart really provides a pretty good go, no go gauge. If you ask me, Jesse, is kind of like the soybeans. Are we going to be able to turn this market around and go back up above this trend line? But December cattle and the fat cattle market only, the December contract only, has rallied 10 months in a row and held that trend line for the last six months. We're now back below that trend line, and that's going to flash a sell signal. Those stochastics at the bottom of the chart are flashing a quote sell signal because it's suggesting strongly there's going to be a lot fewer new buyers come in this market. So, again, we've got a fundamental factor out there that could change things very, very quickly. Let's see if it does. But if a week from today, this is a monthly chart. If a week from today, you and I are talking about this market being below that trend line, that's a warning flag to like the soybeans, get some fourth quarter put spot in feeders and in fats. Yeah, and it's great to look at a chart like this and think about that because, you know, Mike, it felt like uh, that cattle on feed report we had last Friday was old news pretty quickly. So it feels like that we get a few news items here and there, but we quickly go back to the charts and the fundamentals right now in this cattle market. Yeah, and you, to your point, the equities markets has been have been bouncing around like crazy. They yeah. had a very nice day on Wednesday, but the hogs had a very bad day because we are now seeing that belly seasonal. The BLT seasonal is crashing Bellies are going nearly straight down at this point in the last few days. And it makes sense. Hogs are not going to provide that much support. Hogs and beans are going to be, I think, more sensitive to China as we get into the next few weeks. You mentioned the uh, stock market real quick. I know we got the Jackson Hole meeting this week. Are you anticipating anything major to come out of that meeting that could impact the markets at all, Mike? I do. I think the speculative investment clients that I work with who are in long S&P mini puts right now for September, Jesse, are on call right now for watching Friday and what Jerome Powell says. Do we have enough weak data from China, Europe, and even here in the States uh, with the manufacturing data for him to signal that we don't need to raise rates anymore, that we are working ourselves into a recession? Because it does look like that way to me. So either we'll keep the puts after Friday based upon what he says and the stock market reaction to that, or we'll need to dump out of those and look to move over to December at some point. Mike, great thoughts and analysis as always. And I know if folks want to reach out to you to talk about what's going on in the markets, take a look at a trial of your analysis and more, they can 
do that all very easily. How can they find you, Mike? Best way is to go to globalcomresearch.com. You know, take a look at the product services brochure. We've got a toll-free number on there. We've got a two-week trial you can sign up for. This is the time of year I take a lot of individual calls, and I love it, especially after the close. So please get in touch with me if you have a question or a comment or a concern about what's happening on your farm or ranch. I'd love to talk to you. Mike Zuzalo with Global Commodity Analytics. Thanks, as always, for joining me. Have a great week. Stay cool as best you can. We'll talk to you soon. Sounds good, Jesse. Hopefully we'll see each other next week at the Farm Progress Show. I think that sounds like a good plan. We'll have to share a, a pork or steak sandwich maybe and uh, have a have a cup of water or a cup of coffee, whatever the case is. Sounds like it's going to be hot again next week too. <laughs> so. yeah, I'll, be at the, I'll be at the U of I-10 on Tuesday. Sounds great. Mike, thanks as always. I appreciate it. You bet. Thank you, buddy. And that's going to do it for Market Talk today. Find us online, markettalkag.com. I'm Jesse Allen. Have a great afternoon.